Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started because we have a packed agenda today and we want to be sure to leave enough time for everybody to uh, ask questions or have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us on uh, Wednesday, May 11th at uh, 11 Central. Uh, we really appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedules. If you have an opportunity to, please use the chat uh, to be able to ask questions or uh, also let us know who you are, if, you're, uh, if you can do that, and uh, your pronouns and also uh, where you're at uh, would be great. The, uh, so with that, let's go ahead and start. Uh, we're really excited today. We have Ankit Sanghavi, who is uh, executive director of Texas Health Institute, uses his pronouns he and him. Ankit is also the project lead for our uh, PCOI projects, which we're going to talk about shortly. Sebastian Smith is, uses he, him pronouns, is the outreach director uh, for National Center for Transgender Equality, and has just been awesome to work with as uh, we put this presentation together and some of her other work. Emmett Shelling, uh, best bud, uses he, him, uh, exec director from Transgender Education Network of Texas and is our project uh, co-lead uh, transgender liaison for uh, our transport work. Uh, Dr. Junda Wu, who is uh, both a physician and has a master's in public health, uses they, them pronouns. Uh, Junda is the medical director and health authority for San Antonio Metropolitan Health District for the city of San Antonio. And then my name is John Effinger. I use he, him pronouns that I'm at Texas Health Institute. So again, it's great to have you here. And when we go through the session, each person will just turn it over to the next one in line. Uh, a big thank you to Dr. John Carlo, who has been with us from the very beginning with Prism Health North Texas. Uh, Prism Health was uh, helped underwrite a three hour workshop for the Texas Primary Care Consortium that we did in 2018, which was really the first time Transford had an opportunity to put together a national program. You can see the others that are participating in this project and our project partners. Uh, Pride Study, if you don't know about it, it is run by Stanford and University of California, San Francisco, and is a 100,000 person longitudinal study on LGBT folks. So I would encourage you to, to take a look there and then you can see the other folks that we work with uh, or who have funded our project as well. Today, very quickly, we're gonna cut through a couple of things we wanna identify why this particular survey is important and explain the scope of how it's been expanded. Uh, I can tell you that it is the very first document that I ever looked at in terms of how we started to organize Transford. And, and it's just rich with detail. And it's rich with detail because trans and gender diverse people complete the survey. And yes, it's a long survey, but that gives us so much information. And we'll talk about that today as we go through it. Uh, also, we want to really talk about actionable steps that each of us can take in order to be sure that people sign up to pledge to take the survey and then actually do take the survey. It's those completions that are crucial. And then really excited because we have an opportunity to learn how we can actually take this data in a real world community-based example and use it uh, from a healthcare and public health standpoint. And then also to talk a little bit about TransFord and, and why this is important to us. So with that, uh, Ankit, let's turn it over to you and thank you so much for being here. And I'm gonna go on mute and just tell me when to advance the slide. John, <clears throat> thank you again for the kind words and introduction and, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Really pleased to be here and an honor to be along uh, an amazing uh, panel of uh, fellow presenters. Um, uh, John, thank you. Uh, before I get started into uh, and kick off today's discussion, I want to take a couple of minutes just to provide a brief overview for those of you who are, who are new to this work in our organization, uh, just to set a few things into context of what brings us to today's discussion and the work uh, we have pursued over this uh, last few years and what lies ahead of us. Um, again, we are the Texas Health Institute. We are an independent public health institute here in the state of Texas with a vision 
of healthy people, healthy communities, and a mission of advancing the health of all. However, central to this work is our pursuit and our commitment to health equity, and which is ensuring everyone has the opportunities they need free from barriers to achieve their best health. And again, as a public health institute, it is central to everything that we do, but more so, how do we do it? We move the needle on equity by focusing our work on our priority areas of advancing health system transformation, strengthening our public health infrastructure, and promoting healthy communities. I'm often asked, uh, what do you do as a public health institute? Next slide, John, uh, please. Uh, one after. Thank you. I'm often asked, like, so how do you, how do you help uh, uh, pursue change or how do you affect change? And I usually I appreciate sharing this slide again to have that context is that uh, as a public health institute, we are indeed Texas focused, but uh, are nationally engaged and given our, again our role as an independent public health institute and being a member of the national network of public health institutes. Um, our work can be defined across the four areas of leading through research and evaluation with specific focus on applied and community based community driven research. Uh, uh, Complementing that is our work on translation, especially with a focus on policy and systems change. Talking about systems change, it is clear to us that any individual or as an organization, we cannot do this alone. And that's where we leverage our independent role to foster and advance collaborative action and supporting or ensuring sustainable changes our work on providing capacity building and technical assistance support, which is a wonderful segue and helps us dive right into today's discussion. Uh, next slide, John, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to help context this, uh, contextualize this work, and again, for those of you who are uh, new or not so familiar with TransForward, TransForward is a, is a collaboration uh, that is jointly led by Texas Health uh, Institute and Equality Texas Foundation. The work started in 2015, uh, which took shape into a formal collaboration between THI and Equality Texas in 2016. And, and we committed, jointly committed ourselves to, to creating and advancing the vision around TransForward. Why TransForward? Um, uh, we are going to talk about data today uh, and the uh, 2022 US uh, transgender survey. And that's really actually the, the, the genesis of this conversation and why this to, uh, program or effort took place at THI. Um, I spend a lot of time in data. Uh, and back in 2015, 2016, when I was first reviewing and having some conversations internally in our organization as it was related to the data from the transgender survey. Uh, given our focus on health equity, we, we get to slice data in many different shapes, forms, and for different population group. And, and when we started kind of reviewing this information uh, from the 2015 survey, uh, we could not help but uh, have a moment of pause, but really uh, that became the drive for us to uh, start pursuing change. Uh, as we kind of unpeeled the layers, if I may say, uh, to see what needs to change and how uh, we can advance uh, solutions. Um, the, the story started with data, data that can be used to um, inform um, it, or help in identification of issues, but also inform development and implementation of solutions, uh, which is where we were pointed towards the, the vacuum that existed as it related to, to research uh, around uh, competent healthcare for transgender community. And um, as we again further unpeel the layer um, on what could have been the reasons, it really started with not having that research capacity to really support the continuum. And if so, there was research, uh, there was definitely a gap as it related to patient-centered research, uh, which is what brings me to PCORI. And uh, part of the reason, again, for those of you who are not so familiar with PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, that is part of a uh, uh, it's a federal uh, program or a federally funded initiative um, that really took birth again in, in follow up to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act um, in the latter part of the previous decade. Uh, decade. And uh, the, the, the fi I, fundamental idea in, in having PCORI is that it roughly takes about 17 years uh, for <clears throat> a practice to be effective from being a patient issue to begin with. Uh, PCORI was created to help reduce that time frame, but really pursue research that brings in the patient voice and patient experience and effectiveness 
as we as we advance not just the research efforts but start pulling that information into affecting policy and practice change um, which is where PICORI has been a fundamental construct to the work john if you could please advance to the next slide thank you and um, so transforward started with this focus on research capacity building and rightfully we found the support in PICORI and have been truly grateful uh, because since 2018 which is when we received our first award to create a statewide research capacity building network to um, address or advance uh, transgender focused uh, research uh, again with an integral component of uh, the patient voice and patient participation in this pursuit uh, we have been thankful uh, as of today uh, proud to share and uh, grateful to be able to communicate that we have about just about near close to six hundred thousand dollars in research awards or a uh, project awards that we have received from PECORI. Uh, this work does not include uh, some of the follow-up opportunities or more uh, research specific projects uh, that have uh, taken place or have just gotten started within this last year and a half and truly thankful uh, and encouraged for that uh, but it's important to recognize that this wasn't a journey that we accomplished by ourselves. Uh, this has truly been an undertaking, not just here in the state and for the amazing group of friends and community partners that we get to work with, but have been truly grateful to have uh, the support, the, the expertise, and really the, the broader national network that we have been able to be a part of, both through our work through PICORI, uh, but also uh, similar efforts across the country. Uh, some of the partners and individuals that you see here have been an important part of the construct and uh, really help support the continuum of this work. And this is, again, an opportunity for us to, to give them a shout out, but really recognize the, the collaborative uh, that's really uh, being the construct or central to this journey. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> again, I won't get into uh, the details uh, about each one of this work, but again, to help inform today's discussion, really as part of our ongoing pursuit as we seek to further build research capacity, our hope is that over a period of time, we are able to truly move the needle on what, you, what we have been referring to this and what you see here is our theory of change that really affecting change and improving the health of our transgender community through a, a measuring like how we are helping them improve their health outcomes and improve the quality of life is, is begins with a change in mindset. Um, as we do so, we have to identify an advanced potential solution, but also start beginning to test their effectiveness and, and ensuring that they are achieving the impact or change that we desire. Uh, but uh, that being said, we also have to look at the broader systems perspective and making sure that we are building capacity for, for this change to be sustainable and truly uh, achieve the outcomes uh, that helps not just, uh, again, result into better healthcare, but better opportunities and environments for the transgender community uh, to achieve their optimal health. Um, and as part of that onward pursuit, data has been, as I said, has been the genesis of this work to take birth in the first place back in 2015. And it is fundamental to this ongoing pursuit. And as a result of that, I truly find today's discussion to be of value. And again, thank you for joining us in this effort. And with that, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for me to um, introduce Sebastian uh, to talk about the both the need, but the opportunity that we have with the 2022 US Transgender Survey. Sebastian, on to you. Thank you so much, Anki. Thank you so much, everyone, my Texas Health Institute and Trans Forward colleagues and friends and all of you all that are in the audience today joining us. Thank you so much for having me here. And as everyone said, I am Sebastian Smith from the National Center for Transgender Equality, or NCTE, and we will jump right into talking about the 2022 survey. So some of the, um, the 2022 uh, survey partnerships that we are working with this year, amongst many, and we'll talk about a few more, it's the National Queer Asian Pacific Alliance. I'm sorry, it's always a tongue twister for me. Islander Alliance, which is in copy of for short. The Federation of the LGBTQ Asian American, South Asian, Southeast Asian, and Pacific Islander organizations. We're also doing a lot of work with the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition, which is the largest Black trans organization in the U.S. and is actually located, headquarters is located in Texas, so some folks may be super familiar with BTAC. We're also doing a majority of our work with the Trans Latina Coalition and TLC is 
the largest Latina trans organization in the U.S. as well. Next slide, please. And we're going to go on to some more partnerships. This is just a short list of folks that we're working with. And then towards the end of this, uh, this, this slide, and if folks, I'm sorry, towards the end of the webinar, and if folks have questions about how they can be a part, I also have information for that. So we can continue to add to this list of amazing organizations and partnerships and, and folks that we're working with. So you can see the list of folks here. And these folks are, were indicative of our priority populations. I'm gonna hit on our priority populations, what we were really focusing on too as well for this particular version of the survey. And these organizations and um, some community partners as well, um, individual community partners, um, are, are the folks who service our priority population. So you see AARP and SAGE who service our, our older adults our old, and also older trans adults. You see our veterans um, associations here that service our trans folks. A, a few um, partnerships with individual um, indigenous folks and partners here on the list here and quite a few more. Um, next slide, please. All right, so here's where we get into the good stuff. What is the USTS? Now that you know that we're working with a bunch of partners around the nation, and that's really the goal, right? We wanted to make sure that this is a community-led survey. Anka spoke to it earlier about having our community be engaged in these processes throughout the whole the whole way through our voices are so important to the care that we receive not just to this survey but to the care that we receive just overall so we wanted to make sure that we center the voices of trans folks and this is a community-led survey. So the U.S. Trans Survey is the largest survey of trans people in the United States. The USTS documents the lives and experiences of trans people across the U.S. and the U.S. territories. This survey is for people for, with all trans identity, including binary, trans women and men, and non-binary trans identities. Back in 2015, because actually, if I can go back even further, we had a, a survey back in 2008. And then we had a survey in 2015. Results came out in 2015 for uh, 2009 for the 2008 survey. And then it was fielded in 2014. The results came out in 2015, just to give some folks some sense of a timeline. But back in 2015, we did an amazing job. We have over 28,000 trans binary and non-binary people to take the survey, making it the largest survey of its size especially concentrating on our lived experiences and the things that trans people are, 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 like I said, experiencing from day to day. And now it's time to conduct the survey again. It's in 2022. We all know what happened in 2020, right? So this survey is originally um, scheduled to be fielded every five years, once every five years. So from 2015 to 2020, we know what happened, which caused us to delay. So now we are back in 2022 and we have seven years of experiences. We want our community to be able to, to weigh in on. We want our community to be able to lend their voices to, to include the pandemic, there's not, there's not much data out about our experiences in COVID and USTS will cover that. More than ever, it's important to ensure that trans experiences will shape the future. We want everyone here and everyone around the nation to help us continue to make this survey the largest, most diverse survey of all trans identities. Next slide, please, John. So what we noticed back in 2015, we noticed that there were some gaps. There were some gaps in some of our populations. We know that trans folks are not a monolith. We know that we are diverse and there are many, you know, there are many overlapping identities in our community. So we wanted to make sure we could get the voices of all of those members of our communities. Back in 2015, we noticed again that we had some gaps there. We had some gaps and some voices that we wanted to hear from. And the beauty of having the, sur the, the, the survey back in 2015, and now we're able to compare. We're able to see what happened in 2015, versus now, and we're able to see how our community is evolving and, and changing, what the voice is, what the language is, because language has changed as well from 2015. So we were able to compare things and pull out some of those spaces that we were missing. Some of those, um, one of the main spaces that we looked at is the demographic kind of breakdown of our community. And we, we noticed we had some spaces missing. And some of those part, um, population that we wanted to really prioritized this go around was our BIPOC community, which is Black, Indigenous, people of color, older adults, 45 plus, immigrants of all kinds, documented and undocumented, undocumented, 
our rural communities, as well as those that are living with HIV and our Spanish speakers. So we noticed again that those were big gaps in our demographic breakdown from the 2015 survey. And this year we have really, really did some targeted outreach to those specific communities. Those organizations that I mentioned earlier that we have uh, partnerships with service these communities. So with the help of those partnerships, they help us reach down into the, the, the marginalized of the marginalized of the marginalized of our community. So they will know that there is a way for your voice to be heard. There is a way for you to share your experiences through the USTS. Some of the highlights, some of the things that we, we've changed and evolved since 2015. One thing is that we noticed that, you know, we all know what's going around our nation with our trans youth. So we felt it was very important to lower the age of the survey so we can get a good chunk of our youth um, experiences in school. Now we did do experiences in, in schools back in 2015, but our age was 18 plus back in 2015. So we now have lowered the age to 16 plus for our, so we can get a, a, again, a good population of our trans youth to be able to take the survey and give us some of those school experiences to include athletic experiences as well. So we do have 30 plus topics. This will be a big survey. Now, what will happen is that I, again, stuff identifying, I feel like I'm here in safe space. I am a trans person myself, a black trans person myself, assigned female at, at birth. So my survey may not look like the next Black trans person, and it may not look like the next um, Indigenous trans person. All of our surveys are going to differ, differ because what we have included into this, into the, 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 web, the, the, the web hosting platform for the survey is a skip log. So that means that it will, your survey will base, be based upon only your experiences. So I won't get veteran experiences. I won't get the youth experiences. I am 40 <clears throat> years old. So I'll probably get, you know, some different other experiences in there. So all of, you know, all of our surveys will look different. The time that it may take me to take the survey will differ from some, someone else, you know, so that time can range anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, just again, depending on your individual experiences. So again, we have 30 plus topics and a bunch of those are new and a bunch of those are carry over from the last survey and to include COVID, sports, expanded healthcare sections, to include family planning, reproductive health and insurance, which is so very important, especially right now. And there again, there are plenty more topics as well. So our survey will be hosted online by a host by a platform called Qualtrics. This will also make it um, accessible for um, mobile friendly. And then it will, uh, well, thank you, Adri. I had to stop right then and see that one. Thank you so much. I love it. Uh, so again, this survey will be hosted online by Qualtrics. It will be mo mobile friendly and it will be plenty of accessibility options included in that for our folks, for our disabled trans community to include screen readers, to include a way for us to stop your stop and start the survey. You know, if you have time, if you need to disconnect, we are trying, we are working with this system to have a way for you to be able to stop and start the survey um, as you need to. And the survey this year will be in English and Spanish languages. Can you, um, next slide for me, please, John? Why is this so important? I think um, Anki talked a lot about why data is so important. And we know that data is important. We know that there is a lack of data for trans communities, both binary and non-binary communities. But also it is important because we often as trans people don't have a way to share our voice don't have a way to share our actual experiences and have it be documented. And this is a way to do that. Also, USTS is, again, it's the largest data set of trans people in the US. And this allows us, again, to give a better understanding to the experiences of all trans people. It gives power to our stories and to our experiences. It is an essential source of scientific data about trans people that informs media educators, policymakers, courts, the general public, which covers health, employment, income, and the criminal justice criminal justice system, and plenty more subjects. The USTS is a community-led survey by trans people for trans people. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so why and how? You know, we talked again earlier about why data is so important and why, and why collecting data is so important. Data absolutely fuse the work in the advocacy realm that we do. In 2021, we saw more than 250 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced. And by the end of the legislative session, um, we had about 18 of those anti-trans bills that have been passed into law back in 2021. 
already in 2022, we have seen actually, John, I probably could have said 200 at this uh, at this moment. I could have said about 200 plus anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ uh, bills that have been introduced. And the USTS is critical to the work that we're striving to achieve. So we, again, this data is so important because it fuels, again, the work that we do. And we're going to, it's so, it's so disheartening that our voices that are, you know, that I, that, that us showing up in person and saying that this is my experience is not enough. But to have the data behind us, it's just that extra push, it's just that extra step. So that's why data is so important and collecting data is so important for our community on many levels, not just, and I just wanna be transparent and honest, not just this survey, but there are so many other surveys out there, I think that are so important to, to really paint the picture of the experiences of trans folks. Um, so I know this part here, everybody's really interested in, in the timeline. When is this thing happening, Sebastian? I know y'all have heard about it. I know folks are excited. I know we've had, we actually, let me say this right here. We have, I think this may be on another slide, but just a preview. We have about uh, 25,000 plus pledges totally across the nation. So we have 25,000 people who are super excited for this survey and waiting for it to be released. And I know everyone is super ready for it, so am I. So just a little brief timeline review. The pledge period started back in November of last year and we still are currently in the pledge period. Sebastian, what is the pledge? The pledge is just a promise. It's just a promise to, for a community to tell us, hey, we will take the survey when it is released, when the survey is come, comes out and ready to be filled, we will take the survey. And this is also how we guide our outreach as well. Because we're looking at how people are pledging, what demographics are pledging, you know, what states are pledging and what those numbers look like. We shift and move our outreach plan based upon that. We notice that we're not getting the number of pledges that we would like to see from our Black community or from our Indigenous community. We go back to our partners. We go back to our partner organizations that represent those, those folks or back to the community of those folks and ask them, what can we do to, to, to make sure you have access to this survey and just make sure you even know about it. So the pledge is also a tool for us on the outreach side to be able to tailor, pivot, and move our outreach tactic you know, as we're in this in this outreach period and pledging period. So the fielding period, when would the survey go live? The survey will go live in the summer of 2022. We will put out a specific date when that comes out. Right now, this big, large survey is really being, you know, really being kind of scrutinized by our team because we want to make sure this is right before we put it in the community. So what's happening right now is being analyzed and cleaned up. It is being... Um, Upload it into the, the Qualtrics program, the, the web platform that is hosting the, the, the survey for us this year is being uploaded into that program as we speak. So that's going to take a chunk of time. Once that's done, we will have about 150 people to actually test the survey, actually do a pilot run of the survey and take the survey and let us know what the kinks are, the language missing, let us know if there's any, you know, anything that looks off. And once we get the approval, you know, from our, our 150 folks, our, you know, and our research team, we will then put the survey out into the community and announce it being live. What also happens, the benefit of pledging as well, is that you will be the first folks, for, you will also get updates along the, along the timeline, but you will also be amongst the first folks to get the link or know or get the notification that the survey will be live and ready for folks to take. So that's where we are right now in the timeline period of the survey. Again, it is being uploaded into that, that system, and then we're going to pilot it, and we're going to put it out into the community, and we will make sure community knows what that date looks like. So after the, the survey, after we put it out into the community, the survey will be live for about four to six weeks, depending on resources. Once the survey closes, we go right into the, the, the analyzing the data part. And of course, we can anticipate that'll take some time. So while we're analyzing that data, one of the first things we want to do is come out with a shortened executive summary, which gives you kind of the highlights of each of those, each of those, uh, each of the topics that we have. You're going to get an executive summary, which is going to give you the highlight of the data of those, those particular uh, subjects. So that will start coming out at the beginning of 2023, which is the top of next year. And then after the executive summary, the full report will come out, which is this big, long, you know, big, huge amount of data that will come out to show everybody all of the data and how did it bro broke out. And not only will the big report come out, we will also have 
breakout reporting. So we have breakout reporting based on demographics. So we have a breakout report for Black respondents, Indigenous respondents, POC, you know, all of our priority groups, we will have a breakout report for each of those groups. And then we'll also have breakout reports by each state and each territory. So again, the full reports will include a breakout report as well. So you will get to see that data, the executive summary at the top of 2023 and more of the full data kind of mid 2023. So that is a little bit of the timeline. And of course, if folks have questions, I will definitely answer those. John, next slide, please. Where we are today, and I hit it, I just hit on a lot of this stuff just now in the last, um, in the last slide. The survey instrument is currently being uploaded and it will be piloted in a few, re a few weeks. And we're out uh, right now in our outreach plan. We're focusing on getting the word out to the community via community outreach. We are reaching out to celebrities, influencers, and cultural icons. We just got Elliot Page to post a few days ago, and that definitely drove up a lot of our pledges. We are doing some outreach to our U.S. territories. As I stated before, actually, as of today, this number is about 25,000 plus total pledges, which has already surpassed the 2015 pledge numbers. And we're almost creeping up to the respondent number as well. Remember, we had only 28,000 respondents back in 2015, and now we have about 25,000 uh, pledges. So we're creeping up on respondents with pledges, and we're hoping that pledges are indicative of the, the folks who will actually take the survey. So Texas right now has 951 pledges or 5.9% of the total pledge um, amount and ranks number two for the most pledges so far. Great job, Texas. Texas is going and out of the water. Pledges are, we do have pledges in from all 50 states and we do have at least one pledge from each of the territories. Next slide, please. And here's some ways to support. Of course, spreading the word. We, you know, social media now runs our lives. So of course, you know, make sure you're following not only NCTE, but our partner organizations because they too are sharing information about the survey and you can just share from our page or share from their page. So be sure to check our social media and share out any information. If you're an organization here today that has any kind of newsletters or monthly emails that you send out, please let us know so we can send you our materials. If you would please include any of that in your newsletters connect with our partner organizations about the survey. Again, you can look those folks up on social media. That's what all of us are usually the most active at, and that's across all of the platforms that are out there. Um, we wanna make the pledge accessible to your community here on the screen here, you can see some examples of the pledge card. If you have or have resumed um, in-person services and you have any in-person facilities that folks uh, community is coming to, we can mail you pledge cards as well. And the QR code that you see on these pledge cards links folks back to the USTS. And then um, it also links folks right now to the pledge of USTS. But when the survey becomes live, it will then link folks right to the survey. So we can also share that information with people so we can mail you out, print you out and mail you some of those palm cards if folks are, are interested in having those in, the, in their physical spaces. And then invite us like we are here today, invite our team over to do a webinar or to talk about the survey or do a community event, event with you to talk more about the survey. So next slide, please. And it is my esteemed pleasure, you know, again, before I do that, if folks have any questions, I do some, see some in the chat, I'll roll back through and try to answer those in the Q&A. But next up, it is my esteemed pleasure to hand it off to my colleague with Tent Emmett. It's up to you now. Thanks so much, Sebastian. <clears throat> so sorry. Had a little bit of tech issues here uh, on the road. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, as Sebastian, uh, you know, went through uh, all the reasons, right, uh, on a national scale, collectively, uh, why we know the survey has been incredibly important uh, to our community. Uh, I, I will say, like, in the vast majority of the work that I do. Um, on the research end of things, uh, the U.S. Trans Survey is cited um, probably 95% of the time um, as one of the like uh, data points. Um, and so I'm going to bring it into a Texas lens because that's who I am, because uh, everyone wants to talk about everything else, and I'm just here to talk about Texas. Uh, 
for Texas, it's incredibly important that uh, we get our community to really show up uh, to make the pledge and follow through and make sure that we get our information uh, into the survey. Uh, we are a state with the second highest population of transgender people. So I was really excited to see that we're the second highest uh, right now in pledges. Uh, we're going to keep up that energy uh, and uh, keep making sure that uh, the population here um, across the board, right, is, is able to uh, get access, uh, learn about the pledge, uh, and, and fill that out. Uh, because what we do know about our state is that given the, the geographical size, uh, we have a um, really interesting makeup in our state, uh, which uh, provides, you know, very specific, unique obstacles for what that means uh, in our full and whole selves, uh, being trans uh, and understanding um, if I live in Houston versus if I live in the Valley, that looks like a completely different reality um, for what uh, that might look like for me. And uh, with that said, uh, I'm gonna link it into some of the other things that unfortunately Texas makes the news for uh, in the legislative sense. Uh, one of the things that we are up against is literal erasure. There's no question about it. We know that we know. Um, and so where, you know, one of the things that I talk a lot about in my work is that how this was able to happen was because there was a lack of investment, um, you know, prior years to understand uh, trans populations, understand especially our unique um, obstacles when it comes to accessing quality, uh, competent healthcare. And then what does it link into right now um, in, in terms of these legislative uh, battles that have really sought to harm the community um, by literally using uh, kind of ambiguity about who we are uh, and also ambiguity about the data and the statistics of the, the facts around who we are. What, what really makes our lives what they are here in the state. Uh, and so we're gonna be working uh, you know, closely uh, with, with all the partners that y'all saw. And of course, Sebastian uh, doing just uh, great work at NCTE. Um, and we're really excited uh, to keep rolling. Uh, and for us at TENT, uh, you'll see some uh, events that we're gonna have uh, kind of bringing community together. Uh, as Sebastian said, it's a long survey. Uh, and so I was like, hey, what do you know? We can just get people, come hang out, eat some food. You know, we can take a breather. Uh, we can have folks on hand if people have questions about like uh, what that looks like on certain questions. I know for me, like I think into questions way too much and then it it distorts data apparently. So uh, you're gonna try to have folks uh, there to, to be helpful with that as well. So really looking forward uh, to seeing the state of Texas really come out, I think in uh, every facet of who we are, uh, the more I do this work, the more I learn about what a unique, uh, beautiful and just like, uh, completely different and in so many ways population that we have in our state that really doesn't replicate other states uh, that I um, travel to and work within. And so I really encourage our community, you know, let's bring some big Texas energy to this, you know, I, we're, we may be a little bit, uh, I guess, arrogant competitive. So let's get our numbers to really reflect uh, our presence here in the state uh, so we can really use this data uh, to leverage and shift our progress forward uh, because, you know, we, in the state, I think there's a dire, a dire recognition of the need for data uh, around our communities, the need of the impact of COVID that had on our state. Um, and, and so really hope folks can, uh, uh, you know, make the pledge, uh, fill out the data, uh, fill out the survey, and thank you so much. Uh, I now get to introduce uh, Dr. Junda Wu, uh, who's in San Antonio, and uh, just, a, I mean, just a phenomenal person. Like, I think from the start of my career, uh, she was one person that I heard about uh, so often, uh, and so such an honor to get to introduce her. Well, I, I, likewise, it's a 
Mutual Fan Club, Emmett, thank you. I am going to go through these slides really quickly. Next slide. I, 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 you've heard a number of us say it's a long survey. So why? Here are 17 reasons to fill out a long survey. Here's a really specific example that enlarges on what Sebastian was talking about. Um, the, here's an example of where the Williams Institute cited the 2015 trans survey on the left. On the right, the Williams Institute's study that is citing the survey is quoted in this National Institutes of Medicine report. And because of that report and others like it, next slide, um, last year, the US uh, census decided to add a sex and sexual orientation and gender identity question to one of its uh, sort of mini, it's not the annual 10, I mean, it's not yet, yeah, not the every 10 year census, but something called the Household Pulse Survey. And as a result of that, next slide, you can see, you can actually go online. I'm, I'm sure these slides will be available later and look up the percentage of transgender people in the state of Texas extrapolated from that household pulse survey. So when you have a little more data, then you end up wanting more, you end up having justification to get more. And that's a very effective, um, that's, that's a big need of this survey and of your participation um, for public health. Next slide, please. For healthcare, this is just three examples. As I think Emmett alluded to, there are a lot more of uh, healthcare guidelines from organizations like the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association that directly cite the US Trans Survey. Next slide. And for reasons three to 15, I've listed all the categories that were in the 2015 survey. And as Sebastian said, there are gonna be 30 categories this time around, um, which is a reason that it takes a while to process the data. Next slide. The other reason, so you might've, at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so yeah, it's important um, that somebody fills out the survey, but why do I have to fill out the survey? You know, you have 25,000 people, you've got 900 people in Texas, you're good. No, the more people we have, the more you can pull out parts of the data. So as an example, if you want, you know, if you want to study the data from African Americans, you only need a certain amount. And then if you want it to be African American men, then you're going to need more because you're breaking it out. And then if you want to separate by age group, then you need even more people to answer. Otherwise, if you have very small numbers of people who answer a question, um, which this is what often happens with transgender people as a whole in start surveys, that data is not reported out at all because the group was too small and it's considered not to be analyzable in a, in a statistically meaningful way. Next slide, please. It's also important for public health data infrastructure to have a recurring survey like this where we can refer back survey over survey and see changes. So I am listing on this slide, eight national data systems like that, but they only collect sexual orientation data. And then on the slide after that, next slide, John, we've got three data systems that actually have started to collect gender identity data all since 2015. Um, and next slide. And now that that has started to happen, when once you start asking, you realize what you don't know and where you need more information. So now there's something called Healthy People. Um, it, there was Healthy People 2020, and now we're working toward Healthy People 2030. This is uh, a, a group of, of standards and goals that we in public health work toward nationally. And you can see that now there's a national goal to increase the number of surveys that collect data on transgender populations. And my last slide, it's not specifically related to the US Trans Survey, but just to let you see, here are the other objectives in Healthy People 2030 that relate to transgender people, um, reduce suicidal thoughts in transgender students, reduce bullying of transgender students, reduce the proportion of transgender high school students who've used illicit drugs, and increase states, territories, um, and 
in the District of Columbia that use the standard module on sexual orientation and gender identity in a widely used behavioral survey. And I think that's it for me. And I'm going to turn it back over to John. Thanks, Judah, and, and Ankit, and uh, Sebastian, and Emmett as well. Uh, we're going to take questions in just a second, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the uh, this particular screen, and then we have a contact uh, slide that we'll do next uh, after this. But one thing I did want to note, uh, a couple of things that Junda had on, on uh, their slide. One of them uh, recognized American Heart Association, and Carl Street uh, has been key in one of our uh, milestones that we're putting together for our first project uh, from PCORI and doing two ancillary research studies. So again, it's going taking data and going back and, and looking at the longitudinal uh, uh, material that's in the PRIDE study. And the PRIDE study really was our first community engagement partner. We've learned so much in working with them and now how we can try to take some of that experience and apply it with the colleagues that we work with in Texas and across the nation. So uh, we'll be sure that you have links to two things. One, uh, the PRIDE study, and then also to uh, Carl and uh, Carl's colleagues at the American Heart Association and some of the work that they've been doing. So with that, let's go to questions. Uh, I've got three up in the Q&A. Uh, first one is, uh, and I think we started to answer it, uh, but Sebastian, maybe if you can just one last uh, time on this, do we have specific uh, start and end dates? Right now, we don't have the specific start date for the survey. Once we get the specific start date for the survey, we will make sure community knows that well ahead of time so folks can plan accordingly, especially like Emmett stated, you know, if folks want to have events, you know, to bring community in the survey, we want to make sure we let folks, you know, give some folks some lead up time before it's actually um, set to be out and be ready for people to take. Once it is out, we hope it to keep it out and available for folks from four, at the very least four weeks. And then if there's additional resources, we wanna go an additional two weeks. What we will be doing along that timeline is also just reviewing kind of the demographic of um, the, the, the respondents that we're getting to also see where we're lacking. We noticed back in 2015, like some of our black respondents really didn't, it really didn't have access to the survey until later in the survey. So we got a bump in black respondents around the last week that the survey was open. So we're gonna look at things like that and see where, you know, where we're lacking at, where we, you know, where we need to, to target some more outreach to also determine if we need to continue to go out another additional week. So it'll be either, once it's filled it, it'll be out for four to six weeks. Okay, so I've got one question, if you can start with it, uh, Sebastian, but then mm -hmm. this really goes into Ankit and Emmett and Jid and what you talked about. Uh, and it's, will the USTS data be made available to members of a broader research and advocacy community for secondary analysis? And I'll preface to say that Dr. Ray Aloza, who's at University of Texas El Paso and is really one of our key people in what we do in transport and co-leads our region seven, has done some secondary analysis on here. We're getting ready to do that through our LBJ School Project Connect, but can you talk a little bit about that and then circle back to Ankit, Emmett, and Judah talking about the value for a lot more of us having access to this data because we all look at things a little differently. Yes, absolutely, John. So yes, the answer to the question is yes. Even if you were to go back to the link that we shared in the chat a moment ago with the pledge and all of the, the things, the updated things on there, there actually is a way to request the um, the data from 2015. So when this, this survey data is out and all the, you know, we have all of the reporting done or starting to do the reporting, there will be a way for folks to, re uh, to request Second, you know, request data for secondary analysis. So yes, is the answer to the question. And I'll pass it over to Anka to uh, Junda if you wanted to add into that. I don't think so. I mean, between John and Sebastian, you have you have responded really to the question, so it's available, and that's really part of our motivation uh, on why we are having this conversation. And again, uh, it's it's part of uh, both um, uh, awareness building as part of our effort on how we seek to use it and how we want more researchers to kind of uh, start collecting and utilizing this data. Um, so if there are ways, I think, since you have asked the question, if there are ways and ideas that you have for us on how we can further um, 
support those efforts where more researchers across Texas and across the country are able to use this or, uh, you know, whether you need help with interpretation, translation, getting it out. Um, this is where, where, our, where our work comes into play. So um, thanks, John. Thanks, Sebastian. Jinda, any thoughts? Okay. This, this one comes from uh, our rock star, Rocky, uh, who has been so very active in our work in trying to reach not only grassroots BIPOC communities, but specifically grassroots leaders to get involved in a lot of our transformative work. Since Emmett and Rocky came on board uh, halfway through our first uh, project, we have really had an intentional focus. And so Rocky asked, how can we use this data to ensure the health and safety of our local communities? Examples would be great. So I can, I can uh, go in on that one, I suppose. Uh, I think one of the things that we really learned um, and you know, where we're at in timing, right, is, is looking at the previous survey, we were able to really take those numbers on a municipal level and compel uh, local um, health entities, uh, health departments, uh, municipalities uh, to understand uh, the community for one, but also really kind of link it in uh, to a greater understanding about uh, what that local leadership needed to look like, uh, how we needed to respond. Um, I think COVID is probably a really good example, unfortunately, of where that was very important because understanding, you know, not just the transness, but like all of the other things that unfortunately then like uh, create stigma and bias and then um, unfortunately play into this access around what happens to us, right? Um, and so where Sebastian had talked about, you know, uh, up until the last week for the last survey, really there hadn't been uh, the reflection of Black trans uh, respondents that we knew, you know, as a community looking around, like, like, come on, like, <laughs> we're here, like, and also, you know, really to like piece together that important part where we know socioeconomic and race and uh, disability, like, um, and region all come into play of knowing what does this look like on a local level? Uh, because I think like in Texas, unfortunately, that is where we really need to like uh, hyper-focus where we can make that uh, movement, right? We can make progress. We can make space to make sure that trans people um, on a local level uh, are uh, being recognized, understood, and like uh, there are being outreach uh, in an intentional way uh, on a municipal level um, to really support and also address, uh, you know, how, how to reach the trans community when it came to like vaccinations, uh, how to get that information. Uh, what were the like, you know, what did that look like um, for the outreach? What did it look like for the success? Because I think the thing that people don't talk about, right, when it comes to these components is the importance of an entity already understanding a population before coming in to attempt to address it. Because coming in to attempt to address it without information about that population is a waste on both sides. And so really this zeroes in and it, it, it brings an efficiency and it also brings this data point to compel. So it's a two prong thing. And really I encourage folks to look on a, on a local level. How can you take this when we get these, uh, you know, stats back and take it in your own, you know, leadership in your own advocacy on that local level, knowing that the local like government actually plays a much larger part in our day-to-day -day reality uh, than sometimes the federal because of, you know, bureaucracy. Yeah, there's a saying that what gets measured gets done. So if you if you don't have anything to measure by, then you can't you can't drive change. You can't incentivize people to want to change something. And then once you have the first measurement with the repeated measurements, you can see if you're making progress. Let me go to one more and then um, then we're going to start to move to closing. Um, and Stephanie, if you can 
or Sebastian look at the, the question, the last question that was asked on social media kits, that would be great to answer that uh, and do that in chat. Uh, this goes to our other resource that we use, uh, Williams Institute. And so is there an estimate of how many trans people are of Hispanic or uh, Latin origin uh, in Texas? And uh, maybe this gives us a chance to talk a little bit about Williams and, and uh, why we, while they do really terrific work and that is our gold standard in terms of estimates of numbers uh, why uh, Texas uh, numbers may be a little bit of an undercount. So any thoughts on that? I think if I remember uh, the current estimate was based on 2014 Burfus data uh, was 48% of uh, population in Texas uh, was uh, Hispanic Latin, uh, but I may be wrong. And Emmett, why don't we go to you and then uh, Jenda, if you have thoughts and certainly on kit because it gets into the question of Burfus and it kind of ties back to Jund about different data sources. <laughs> I'm so sorry, tech. Um, it, so around uh, estimated how how many uh, Latin uh, Hispanic origins is that specific? Uh, I will say I I would not feel comfortable to say we have a good number on that. Uh, I also want to defer, you know, to uh, Sebastian as well uh, to kind of get context. Um, but in terms of, I, I think it links back to like what I had mentioned earlier, right, where we had uh, that the, saw the delay of like black trans folks responding and it, it wasn't adding up. That is, uh, you know, it, and I would say not a scientific sort of measure, but my measure in terms of in the work I do, uh, especially in the state of Texas, in the numbers I see, they just don't add up. Um, and so I think that is another population, especially when we're talking about Texas, uh, I think where, where people don't realize the uh, really high population of black, uh, you know, trans, well, black people, right? Uh, people of color, indigenous people. And so like really that breakdown, uh, I would not feel comfortable to say we have a good number right now. So I'll jump in really quickly on that one, John. So as we relate, and I'm going to talk about kind of the numbers right now, as you know, um, put it into context as I look at some of the breakdown numbers right now. Um, what we wanted to do also just to preview this with the demographics, which you'll also see, which is also groundbreaking, people will get to identify with each and every part of themselves. So even our indigenous community will be able to identify with their tribes. You know, if you are a multiracial racial person, you will be able to identify with each part of what those pieces of your race look like, you know, which is also different for surveys, which also makes it, <coughs> excuse me, which makes it that much more larger, but that much more comprehensive. So we'll actually be able to break down things um, by demographic in a much more detailed way than what we were able to in the past. But as we're looking at numbers right now, our Latino and Hispanic community accounts for about 9.1% of the total amount of pledges that we have. That number is a little bit under 1,500 total pledgers. And that actually means that our Latino and Hispanic community, sorry, Texas, are number two on this list or number two on the demographic list for the amount of pledges that we have. So our, again, our Latino and, His and Hispanic community is definitely coming out and definitely pledging to take the survey and is aware of it and is really, you know, really, really showing up. And then we look at some of those other numbers, our multiracial folks, we have about 5.9%, our black folks are about 4.4%. And this is, like I said, as of today. So we do have a wealth of, our, of that particular demographic signing up to take the survey. So that equals a lot of data is what I'm getting to. That equals data that we have not had before on this particular demographic of community. Any other thoughts as we get ready to close out? And I wanted to, uh, Maybe, and let me put this into chat. Uh, Transport has roughly 42 people on our research engagement advisory council from a whole range of organizations. So we would not be able to do our work 
uh, if we didn't have those folks involved, and that doesn't include the national partners that I could mention. Uh, but a special shout out, shout out just because of the work that it took to put this webinar together really goes to Stephanie, Katie, Konica, and Megan from our THI staff uh, that I listed in the chat. Uh, Ricardo Martinez at Equality Texas has been uh, a key partner from the very beginning, as Ankit mentioned, and then also Brad uh, Pritchett and Jonathan Gooch there, and then Jen Pham at uh, Tent. So those folks had a very uh, active part in making this webinar possible. It's 12 o'clock. We want to be respectful, 12 o'clock central. We want to be respectful of everybody's time. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close out. Uh, with a thank you to each of the panelists, uh, Ankit, Sebastian, Emmett, and Jenna, thank you for all the time and effort you put into this and helping us make this work for us. And then uh, Stephanie and Katie have put the link to two things. One is our survey monkey. Uh, we take seriously uh, the responses that we get back. So help us learn how we can continue to improve in these webinars and what we do as well, because it gets into some of the transport questions there. And then uh, last but not least, and most importantly, uh, be sure to take the pledge. And with that, I do wanna do one final shout out to Jamison Green, uh, who's a past president of WPATH. Uh, Jamison was the very first person we started to turn to in working nationally when we met out at the Pride Study uh, in-person summit a long time ago. And I personally have learned so much from him. With that, thank you all very much. You all have a good day. Appreciate it.